Wow, I always wonder when I have to follow Tim O'Reilly about what on earth I'm going to say. A man who quotes poetry and the Luddites is a man after my own heart. I also realize, given what you've heard so far, I'm actually in a really nice place because I want to talk about the stories of AI too, but from the point of view of an anthropologist. There's lots of ways of describing AI. I suspect you'll hear many of them on this stage over the next two days. For me, my favorite working definition at the moment comes from my colleagues Kate Crawford and Meredith Whittaker, who defined AI recently in a publication as a constellation of technologies, including machine learning, perception, reasoning, and natural language processing. You might reasonably ask, why would an anthropologist care about those things? And of course, the reality is AI is more than a constellation of technologies. You heard Tim talk about all the ways in which AI is woven into the human experience. I also want to suggest that it's a cultural category in and of itself. The fact that we can talk about the language of is AI going to take our jobs, we can refer back to the Luddite rebellion, tells us that AI is more than just a set of technologies. It's actually a cultural thing. It's a cultural category. And cultural categories, that's what anthropologists love. That's firmly in my wheelhouse. Now, the challenge here is, as an anthropologist, usually the way I like to make sense of things is I want to go hang out with them. We do field work, right? We go spend time in the places where meaning is being made. We go spend time with people and ask them things. It's a little hard to think about how you would go do field work with AI. I can think about doing field work with the people who make AI. I can think about hanging out around algorithms and their impact. But I wanted to kind of take a different tangent here and suggest that maybe what you could do instead was an ethnographic interview. So in anthropology, one of the ways of getting sense of something is to conduct what we would call a semi-structured interview. It's an anthropologist named James Spradley who wrote the definitive book on doing this back in the 1970s. And he said, if you really want to get to the basis of something, to the bottom of it, to how a person makes sense of things, you should ask them three kinds of questions. You should ask them descriptive questions to get them to talk about their world in their own language. You should ask them structural questions to get them to sort of talk about how they make sense of their world. And you should ask them contrast questions so that you can work out what they think they aren't. Pretty simple, right? And so for me, that meant there were five questions I wished I could ask AI, and I'm going to try and ask those questions and speculate what the answers might be. As a good anthropologist, the first question is, what's your name and how did you get that name? Of course, asking that question of AI is interesting, right? The politics and the polemic and even the etymology of the name itself tell us something. I would argue it would only have been in the 1950s in America that artificial was a good thing. If we were naming AI now, we might not want to use the word artificial. We consider that to be somewhat a problematic thing. We talk about organic and local and natural or the fetish objects. But if you think back to the 1950s, artificial was a good thing. It was human-made. It was different than the natural, which was wild and uncontrollable and messy. Artificial had all the kind of shininess that Tim was just talking about of the post-war period. Artificial was about rubber and aluminium, not aluminum, and about all those things, right? It was about a world we were making, and that was seen as being good. And of course, intelligence here is also about this notion of skills that can be acquired. It's about learning. It is, of course, always set in opposition to the emotional, the irrational, again, the messy. And here you have this really interesting contrast in the naming between two words that have an interesting relationship to each other. What does the difference between artificial and intelligence tell us, and what is going on in that naming convention, right? You could ask the same things about machine and learning and putting those two things together. The mesh of the human and the machine there is sort of a fascinating thing. So that would be one kind of descriptive question. A second one would be to go, well, who brought you up? Who raised you? In the anthropological tradition, who are your mummies and your daddies? In this case, it's a lot of daddies, I have to say. And of course, the history of AI is equally complicated in its name. While many of us know AI was coined at a conference in 1956 at Dartmouth here in the United States, and many of the early founders of AI were at that conference. And they were mostly, well, in fact, nearly as I can tell, entirely men. Um, they had very different preoccupations and concerns. They were radically interdisciplinary for the 1950s, had backgrounds in philosophy and mathematics, psychology, emerging field of computer science. And while they had very different backgrounds and concerns, their notions of what it meant to be human and how humans learnt were strongly influenced by behavioral psychology and by the behaviorists of the 1940s and 1950s, in particular a man named B.F. Skinner, 
who had an idea about how humans worked that was about stimuli in, response out. And that if you could track the stimuli, you could predict the response, and if you change the stimuli, you could change the response, what we would otherwise know as conditioning. Now, of course, if you want to think about building a machine, that is an excellent way to think about how humans work. Of course, Skinner was also in himself a moment reacting against Freud, the messiness of European psychology and the messiness of humanity. So when you ask who raised artificial intelligence, it was raised by a very particular set of people with a very particular set of histories and funded by a very particular set of institutions and governmental agencies. So who raised AI? A good question. You can also ask, where did AI come from? Like, who's its people? Where's its country? This is more of a structural question. Tim flagged some of those, right? AI has a long lineage and many places it could call home before it was artificial intelligence. Human beings have been fascinated with making things come to life for thousands of years, I would say. We have myths inside most traditions about what it means to bring things to life. Early human societies to the present day, lots of tales of that. They're mostly moral tales, they're mostly cautionary, and they frequently end badly. Think Gollum, Frankenstein, and the Terminator to just be one lineage. And of course, the practicalities of physical machinery were complicated too. The digesting duck here, the mechanical Turk, the Babbage machine. The question becomes, what are you mechanizing and why? What is the prize you are after about what makes something human or real or intelligent? Those are also questions not about just who raised you, but where you come from. There's, of course, the question, again, a structural question of what do you do every day? A good question I often ask when I'm doing fieldwork, so what's a typical day for you like? Well, we know a typical day for AI is a little complicated. We could argue if Hollywood told us AI is coming to kill us, the robot apocalypse and everything else. If we listen to the news, and Tim just gave you a lovely sense of the headlines, yeah, it's going to replace us, us and our jobs. Of course, the reality is infinitely more complicated. We already live in a world riven through with algorithms, some of them benign and banal, from Amazon to eHarmony and Netflix, some of them more complicated around sentencing guideline tools and risk predictors. We start to have the beginnings of a semi-autonomous and autonomous machinery, and they're unevenly distributed, and the regulations are complicated, and oh, by the way, they all already have built into them a country and a culture. That there to many engines, some of them being Google's visual ones, reads as graffiti. If you're from Australia, you know that's a wall of a shearing shed, and those are the names of all the men who sheared there over the last hundred years, and I can read that wall and tell you when the good seasons were and when the bad seasons were and when the war happened. But that's because I recognize that as a cultural object, and as we start to think about how things are made sense of, culture here will turn out to matter too. And last but by no means least, there are Spradley's classic contrast questions of what aren't you? So can we ask an AI object what it dreams of? Could we talk about artificial subconscious or an artificial id? Would that even make sense? This object here is a painting rendered by a performance artist in Japan who hacked a Roomba and turned its dust-sucking vents into paint-blowing vents and imagined what the art would look like. When he did that, he's starting to speculate about what would the artistic intent of an object be. Back in the early days of AI, one of the founding participants, a man named McCarthy, actually argued that machines might have beliefs, and if they did, how would we manage them? He said if they were sentient, they must also have, in some ways, a core set of principles, which were remarkably akin to beliefs. But if we ask a set of questions here and start to assume that AI isn't just intelligence, but beliefs or a subconscious, we should then also ask questions about what it might mean to have dreams and what it might mean to have intentionality beyond the things that it is trained to do. So where does all of that leave us? Well, for me, I think it starts by saying we ought to critically interrogate AI, not just as a technology, but as a culture. And that as we make sense of it, there are a series of things that open up a broader set of conversations. If we understand the politics of its name, we can understand partly how it is that we think about it and what it might mean to rename it and imagine it differently. If we know who its founders are, we can ask questions about what were their biases and their preoccupations and what, as a result, might we need to bring back into the conversation, including, I would suggest, an approach to interdisciplinarity. 
If we understood the intellectual and cultural genealogies of the people and of the objects themselves, I suspect that opens up ways of managing fear, but also of new possibilities. If we think about the work of AI as also the work of humans and of us making AI, that means we're encoding it with our own biases and normative thinking. And frankly, as a good feminist, I wonder about a little bit more feminist theory and perhaps a bit of queer theory here to unpack what it means to be normal. And last, but by no means least, perhaps when we talk about AI, we also ought to talk about things like love and fear and hate and our humanity and perhaps even our souls, because as we do that, what becomes clearer is that AI is just another manifestation of what it means to be human, and putting our full human selves back into that conversation turns out to be critical. So with that, I want to end and say thank you.